Hello and welcome to the Wisden Cricket Weekly Podcast, coming to you on December 27th, our second Christmas special. Uh, we'll go over some of the cricket that's been taking place over the last week or so, the end of England series in the Caribbean, the first two days of South Africa against India, and then we'll have some time for your questions as well. We've also got a couple of pre-recorded segments, one with Matt Roller on the IPL auction and one with the MP John Speller on his plan to bring Test Cricket back on free-to-air television in the UK. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is Mark Butcher and Ben Gardner. First up, it feels like quite a long time ago now, but West Indies ended up taking that T20i series against England 3-2. In the penultimate game, Phil Salt scored his second hundred in as many games, which England won. And then at the same venue in the, in the series finale at Trinidad, albeit on a much slower pitch, England collapsed from 110 for four in the 15th over to 132 all out, which the West Indies hauled down in the end, when 150 or so could easily have been enough. Um, but that caps off a pretty grim white ball winter for England. Played 17, lost 11, won just six. After the game, both Butler and Mott were defiantly positive, almost. Mott said England couldn't really have learnt much more from the tour and that it was a newish side, even though there were only three or so players who are likely to be at the World Cup missing. I know T20 cricket is a, is a volatile format, but that's another series where England let go of opportunities when when they had a good footing in a game. Yeah, look, I, I think the, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, isn't it? That it wasn't all disastrous by any means. That the losses in themselves are not massively important. Um, however, uh, it, it certainly wasn't the case that you know everything's tickety boo and. The um, you know the the learning that is, that is being carried forward hasn't also thrown up some things that we knew already. Um, the most disappointing thing for me, if we just focus in on the final T Twenty game, was that England found themselves in a position once again where they we kind of lost lost top order wickets, and then you know we hear we've heard them talk about it forever and ever about the depth. Make sure you've got plenty of depth in the batting. The all rounders are very important, and once again. Rather than having one of those two all-rounders, and in this case it was Moeen Ali and, and Liam Livingston, it, it generally is those two, but kind of sometimes it's a combination of them and somebody else. Rather than one of those two guys or both of those guys deciding, okay, tough pitch, let's try and see it all the way through to the 19th over, see if we can get a, a serviceable score of 150, which would have been enough to win it. Both of those guys did what they always do, which is with six and a half, five and a half overs to go, slogged it up in the air, trying to be positive, et cetera, et cetera, and England fall 30 runs short. Um, and so in terms of things being learnt, yes, we learned that Phil saw, I mean, and I, I'm a huge fan and have been for quite some time. He is the, the natural successor to, you know, to Jason Roy, or you know, who knows, Jason Roy might find himself back in there again, or to Johnny Best. He naturally replaces one of those two guys. He's wildly talented. He's obviously done a lot of work on his game. His offside play now, and I mentioned this during the course of the last summer, um, is now equal to, to his obvious strength through the leg side, um, fitness strength, the whole the whole nine yards. So that was fantastic. Um, but that in the batting is just so disappointing that again and again, 50 over cricket, 20 over cricket, it makes no difference. At no point do England ever find themselves four down and then get to a t- total that they can defend. They find themselves four down, all out. For, for way less than, than than is something that their bowlers have a chance to to um to service. And that's I'm getting a board watching it, board watching it, board talking about it. Um and it's about time, I think. Um and you know, Mo and Ali probably well, I don't know. I don't know if he makes it to the to the T twenty, the next T twenty. But there has got to be somebody, a, an all rounder, who is going to bat at number six or number seven, who every once in a while sees the game through to the end, having won it if you're chasing or having managed to to post something that gives your bowlers a chance at the end. Because I know, I know we had a bit of a chuckle because we were looking up some of the numbers, but the numbers are horrific as mm. far as, well, what was it, most most highest score in a winning one run chase, batting at sort of six and blows, like 13 or something in the last two and a half years. I think I think it's even further further back than that. I mean, his his, rec- his record in successful chases is, is, is not good in, in both white ball formats. And I, Ben, I was, I was watching that, um, that last game and, and sort of wondering, you know, when you look at England's T20 players that they have at their disposal, and we had the IPL auction last week as well, it's full of players who are literally the high, most highly valued T20 players in the world. But if you look at Moeen, Livingston, Curran, they're, they're doing different jobs for England than what they do for the franchises that value them so highly. They're not really the cold-blooded 
um, killers at the end of an innings. You know, Moeen, when he has success for CSK, he's br- he's promoted up the order to just target left left arm spin, really. And he's brought in for very specific scenarios. Do you think moving forward to the World Cup, Bairstow's got to come back, Stokes has got to, well, to come back as well. I know that Butler batted up the order this series. Do you think England might drop Butler or Stokes or Bairstow, one of those guys down into four, five, six to just sort of give them a bit more steel in the lower middle order? Uh, well, I, I think you'd expect to see one of them at four. Um, I guess it's, it's, it's been hard to work out actually what England's preferred 11 is, even go, going back to before the last T20 World Cup, because Bairstow got injured. I mean, you think back then it was going to be Bairstow and uh, and Butler opening, wasn't it? You're going to say, you know, going to back Bairstow to do what he does so well in ODI cricket, and then comes the New Zealand series, and then all of a sudden it's it's uh, it's Butler who's actually pushed down. He's not opening there. He's back up. I'd be surprised if it's not Butler and Salt opening in the T20 World Cup, and then we've got this odd situation with Dad Milan, but I expect they'd go Ben Stokes three, uh, Johnny Bairstow four, which is where he'd had sort of like a little bit of success there. Kind of, I guess it was equivocal if it had gone well or not, but before he was moved up to open, when he actually didn't get to open with that leg break. It's weird, isn't it, the mowing thing? Because England's issue in this series overall, they, I mean, they, they've been finding different ways to lose games. But if you were going back to the start of the World Cup, if you were to pick out their one biggest issue, I'd say it's playing spin, probably. And I know these were helpful-ish surfaces. I mean, Adore Rashid was bowled really, really well as well. But they never got... Well, they got on top of Gurukesh Moti in that fourth game, having sort of played him out quite sensibly in the third game. And then he comes back along with Akil Hussain to win that decider. And that... Moeen should give you sort of like a trump card against uh, against good finger spin bowling. I know it's slightly better against left arm spin, as you say, but yeah. And that's not how they're using him. And then Livingston has this weird series where on the face of it, he kind of has quite a good series in a sort of new role at number four, where he's averaging, what, just under 40, striking 160. And yet when you watch him at times, it's like, it almost looks like he does, isn't sure maybe what he's trying to do in terms of, is he getting England up to a score? Is he trying to, supercharged and like in that first game it was things that actually looked quite good because he hit two sixes towards the end of it but him and I can't remember it was him and one of the all-rounders that always talk about these all-rounders kind of felt like they they sucked a bit of momentum out of it and then he hits these two sixes and in the final game sure he they, they, they get out playing tough shots but he's, he's 20 out of 29 it's not as if he's been trying to hit it from ball one so I think that, that I mean that, that there's a few issues but I guess also the issue when, the issue, Ben, is is and, and this is this is the frustration. It's not that they're not good enough ball strikers, or that there's a, t- a certain type of bowling that they should face and they shouldn't face, or any of that mm-hmm. targeting nonsense. It's simply somebody take responsibility and have the have the cold eyed, um, cold eyed steel to to actually do what is necessary to give your team a chance of winning the game, whether that's chasing or batting first. And it's got nothing to do with matchups or anything else. It's got to do with having a, have, having something in here that says. I need to be the guy that gets us to a position whereby even if we only squeak to par or even if we've managed to be 10 over par, I'm going to be the guy that makes sure that happens. And I'm sick and tired of watching those guys in particular walk off with four and a half overs left of the innings and England being 40 runs short of par. That's that's the thing that, that burns my backside. Is it's not the it's it's got nothing to do with sort of who should be where and who's got the ta- most talent or whatever. It's at some point one of those guys has got to do the job that, that batters who, who... And it's really difficult, which is why it's such a specialist position. Batters who bat 5-6 in T20 and, and ODI cricket, 5-6 and 7, they have to have real brains and real ticker in order to do what is required with the bat to put totals on the board because it's the worst position to bat. Easiest is at the top. Most difficult is in the middle. And those guys have done it often enough now for, for every once in a while for them to kind of like you know go, well, you know what, we're in trouble here. The surface isn't particularly good. Let us not slog it up in the air with four overs to go um, and leave it up to somebody else. Let us be the ones to, to sort of make sure that we get to 150 and give ourselves a sniff. And that's all I'm asking. That's all I want for Christmas. Mm. Yeah, but then Livingston was... <laughs> I think he was trying to take responsibility in that fifth game, right? I mean, I know that the shot to get out was bad, but you... How many you overs were left? At some point. How many overs were so, left? Yeah, there, were, there, were, there were three and a half overs left. Yeah. How many overs were left when Mo slogged it up in the air? Yeah, no, I, I, I take your point almost more on mowing and Livingston right. is the he's he's the curious curious one I think to try and work mm. out if he fits in and how he fits in into this side because you look at the series overall you're like he's done well and yet you're actually it's it's almost not I almost think it's a mentality thing in that it's all it's actually 
is it quite a technical thing or is it just that no, it's, when, it's, the, when, the conditions, when the conditions are a bit tougher it almost didn't look like maybe had the the release shot to go from being to score at like 120 130 comfortably rather than either going at under a runner ball and only being able to hit sixes to get you up close to it versus other middle order players who are kind of sort of cruising along at a strike rate that's keeping you in the game I guess so I think that's what happened mm. there was that he was he was trying to be responsible and then he realized well if I keep being responsible we're not going to get to a defendable mm. total anyway and then he hits one up in the air mm. and I, I think that okay, so going back to the, the the you know the, the positivity around that is is that if if now they've all kind of come to the conclusion? Okay, well we've done it. We've done we've done it this way. We've done it badly often enough that people now next time when it really matters in the World Cup will now know that that isn't the thing to do and, and to kind of do it better. I mean that, that's kind of fine. But you're also you're also <laughs> you're also at the point where you go well if they keep doing this if you keep doing the same thing and keep getting the same results are you actually learning anything at all? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess we'll see, won't we? Uh, that's the bottom line. Is we'll find out. We'll find out whether the uh, the learnings and the positivity have, have actually turned into something tangibly good um, next time. There's the feeling to me of learning something and then unlearning it. Like, I thought that was most clear in, in Moti during the series. Like, he tore them apart in early on and then that third game, I almost thought that they had let it get too far away from them and then, because they, they played him out and then they'd smash it at the back end and they chase down the next game, they take him on the rest and the rest of the bowlers. So you're like, right, they've, they've cracked this, they've been sensible, they've worked him out and now they're smashing him. And then the fifth game was all of a sudden the same issues again, and he and he was all over them. And you know he, he's a good bowler; he's allowed to have, allowed to have good days. But I feel like you can mm. find a few examples of that where they'll come off a game being like, "Oh well, now we now have to do this thing," and they might do that well for a game or two, and then something else will be an issue, and they'll have to improve that thing, and they'll forget how to do the thing they previously learned how to do as well. It's like there's lots <laughs> of learnings, but they're learning the same thing <laughs> over and over again, and then and then maybe forgetting it. I'm not sure. Mm. On a, on learning, unlearning and relearning, they've got someone new to learn from in Kieran Pollard who will be part of the group for the T20 World Cup. Butch, he's nominally in to give um, advice on, on local conditions, um, mm. which given that the half, half of the World Cup is in, in the States where Pollard doesn't have a huge amount of experience, I'm, I'm, it, it, it sounds like he'll probably end up doing quite a lot more than they've said he's, he's been brought in to do. I mean, he's got an incredible record as a T20 player, yeah. five-time IPL winner, T20 World Cup winner as well um that seemed like a very shrewd appointment in the run-up to the competition yeah really yeah it's difficult to fault that isn't it um a huge amount of experience everywhere in the world uh, albeit not the states perhaps but um when it comes down to kind of like you know when it comes down to holding your nerve batting at five five and six or four five and six in the last stages of a t20 game then he's your man isn't he so if you want somebody to um to kind of, and it's, perhaps it's, just, it's simply a case of no hold, hold a bit longer, hold till you see the whites of their eyes, hold, 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 and now go. You know, having somebody that is there to kind of give you the confidence to kind of think, um, you know, you think you're going too slowly, but he's going, ah, ah no, just hold. These in these conditions, you need to just wait that little bit longer before you before you show your hand fully. Um, and if and if you can bring a little bit of that to to what are undoubtedly, um, you know, highly skilled ball strikers then then it will be more than more than worth it for sure mm. um ben white gets in touch to say boxing day turn on the tv and guess what of course james vince is on and he's going well um yeah it's one of the unwritten rules of the english winter that if you turn on sky sports or tnt sports at any given time there's a pretty good chance that james vince will be batting and going somewhere going well somewhere in the world um related to that another boxing day guarantee is australia going well when you wake up on um, on Boxing Day. Uh, they, they've started pretty decently against Pakistan in the in the second test match, uh, although Pakistan had a bit of an a bit of an opening before Pat Cummins uh, bowled Babar Azam with an absolute beauty. Um, and then you've got South Africa going extremely well against India. The time of recording, South Africa 254 for five in response to India's 245 all out at Centurion on, on a spicy deck. Um, Kagiso Rabada took five for 59 in the first innings. Dean Elgar at the time of recording is 139 not out in what will be his final test series. Um but what makes Rabada so good? Because the stats are extraordinary. He is the only bowler in the history of the game to take more than 200 test wickets at a strike rate of less than 40. <laughs> um, his spell yesterday, 
I thought it was fascinating because I actually don't think South Africa bowled very well at all. Uh, it was it was sort of Rabada or nothing. Berger on debut bowled pretty well. Yeah. But Curtsy and yeah. Jansen were a bit bit wild. Um, Rabada's ball in particular to Coley was, was almost unplayable, sort mm. of angled in. Um, and then moving away late, uh, he got Aya when I was was well set as well. He got Rohit Sharma. Um, what what makes him this good? Um, well, I mean, you kind of covered it really. You, you kind of got a mid mid crease, more than quick enough bowler who can who can move the, move the ball and isn't afraid to sort of pitch it up and and get driven every once in a while. Um, you know, I, we, we've probably not seen the best of him, not particularly not last summer or the summer before whenever they were over in England we seem to be struggling a little bit for for rhythm so we haven't seen that that sort of like him at his absolute best over here for a little while but in South Africa on, on some you know some of those pitches that they start a little green and, and there's a little bit in a the ball's carrying through to the slips he can, he's absolutely irresistible um and I think that there's a, there's a lot to be said for that sort of like that slightly mid 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 crease angling the ball back in with the ability to swing it out at, at speed. I mean, what, what more do you want? It's uh, it's pretty potent stuff. And um, he's, uh, yeah, he's he's a very naughty fast bowler, that is for sure. What was it, like 40, did you say? Strike rate of... No, under 40. Of, under 40. Un- under 40. Under 40. The o- under, wow, that's, that's and um, and if extraordinary. And if you reduce the cutoff to 100 wickets, mm-hmm. um, only... George Lohman, who played his last Test match in 1896, was a better strike rate <laughs> than Rabada. Yeah. Um, ben, it's a it's a funny little period for South Africa in Test cricket because um, Abhishek Mukherjee uh, of, of Wisden India he did a piece sort of outlining um, their their run in the World Test Championship. So they've got a pretty favourable run of fixtures. Um, they, they should actually do do pretty well, but at the same time they've got this series in New Zealand where none of the players who've got SA20 contracts are expected to go there because, you know, the border prioritising that at the moment. Um, but yeah, you know, someone like Rabada, he, he was 27 the last time he played a three-match series. He'll be 31 the next time that happens. But at the same time, sort of because of the World Test Championship, South Africa are playing loads of two-test series. So I think they play 10 tests in 2024, for example. So it's like a, it's an interesting period for South Africa because they, they're also showing that they've still they're still capable of producing some brilliant players who hit the ground running really well. Yeah, it is. I mean, I just, just want to see these guys playing three test series and, and, and longer, don't you? Like, as, and, and they might put together a bit of a run for the World Championship still. And I've been sort of banging this drum for a while that that uh, SA20 sort of weird series against them, that could be the thing that cost them. I mean, their ACs are really easy. I think it's West Indies and Bangladesh they've got away from home apart from New Zealand. And then it's, yeah. is it Pakistan and Sri Lanka at home apart from India? So like, you're actually looking at that and thinking that New Zealand is the hardest one in there, but they have never lost a test series against New Zealand. Now, New Zealand should, should be, you know, thinking this is our chance. But that, and because they play so infrequently as well, you almost forget how good that that team is and good in like kind of a weird way. Like uh, it is a bit like the ODI team, you've got the top six. Um, I guess, I guess you have the, the, it's the, it's the top seven with Broomage at the moment, but this, that's, Janssen at eight is a bit iffy, and it's just the it's also the four quicks is like a it's it's, it's so it's so watchable basically, and it's such a good place to watch Test cricket in South Africa. And I don't really know if it works like this, but you'd like to think that if they were to put on a run to the World Championship final, that might give people a bit of like a sort of like a G up to think let's let's try and make you know South African Test cricket and Test cricket other places as watchable and as good as it can be, and you know in a Welsh Championship three test series you think should be a minimum and ugh, there should be a way to to make that happen but yeah it's a it's an odd situation then you have it so Dean Elgar obviously he's, he's called it he's retired and we're not exactly he's not said too much about why sort of said you know it's the right time but the Safka coach saying that the schedule has somehow played a part in that and that again is just you know, it'll be because he, he just bored kicking his heels not being able to play won't he I mean that's that's yeah. basically it um, you know so he'll end up he'll end up earning earning his money playing county cricket you would have thought um, as not a as not a sought after white ball player but it's just the, you know the lack of the lack of series the amount of time in between them that he's going to have to wait and it's just yeah that's a real shame I mean his his record as, a, as an opening batter for Australia is is, is best bar none uh, for South Africa sorry is his best bar none. Yeah, he he 
he averages 48 in home test matches, mm. which is the, the the most for any South African at home. More than Smith, more than Kirsten, more than Gibbs, etc. Yeah, it's a brilliant yeah. record. Yeah, um, and, you, and you get the situations so like win. in this game where you know India do really really well to get up to to close to 250. You think like, wow, they're that's probably above par. Uh, is just just like in the last series that India kept sort of setting totals around 220 for a separate situation. Like, oh, okay, India must be on top here, and then all of a sudden they just have some some guys who knuckle down and know the conditions and know how to, you know, to bounce back from, from getting beaten and how to make sure it beats you rather than, than hitting the edge. And then they're able to actually put on these sorts of runs. Not, not, not that troubled. It's like, it's, it's weird. It's like there's loads of who's and ours. And yet, you know, D- Dino has not, not given much in the way of a chance in this innings and, and, and he's looking, you know, good, good for a proper big score in his last series. Hmm. No, like the last series, it, the, the batters who've been successful in this test so far have, have scored quite quickly, mm-hmm. like Pant a couple of years ago. Uh, Rahul scored quite quickly, Elgar as well. Um, if you if you get a bat on it at Century, it, 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 you can score quite quickly. It, but the issue is getting a bat on it in the first place when the ball's new. <laughs> um, I like I like the look of Durham's David Beddingham on debut. Uh, obviously got an excellent first class record, played a lot of cricket in England. But he really, um, really reminds me of Mitch Marsh. Mm. actually um and that's probably the first time i've i've said that as a as a compliment um <laughs> marsh is doing very well at the moment marsh uh, was playing the match in the first test of the australia pakistan series but he's a very very clean ball striker and seems to have a, a lot of time um looking ahead to next year by the way i saw a tweet from uh, xavier at crickviz outlining just how big 2024 is for test cricket so um england plays 17 test matches uh, India play 16, Bangladesh play 14, New Zealand 13, South Africa 10, Australia 10, Sri Lanka 10, West Indies 9, Pakistan 8, Afghanistan 7, Zimbabwe 5 and Ireland 2. Um, so after a relatively quiet year, um, I guess given the prominence the ODI World Cup had, uh, Test Cricket is back with a bang in 2024. Um, and he also points out that at the moment there are just two women's test matches scheduled for 2024, uh, as many as we've had in the last two weeks. India beat Australia for the first time ever last week in a women's test in Mumbai. Um, Snay Rana, uh, no relation, was the player of the match. And there was a case of Rana being bowled by Gardner at one point in the game. Um, ben, Rana actually had a brilliant game. She was player of the match, took seven wickets. Um, and is an odd player in that she's almost a test specialist. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, she does, she does play the odd white ball game here and there, but she's by no means first choice in that form. And yet, her, her test record, actually, with with bat and ball, is kind of is kind of brilliant. And she's so important on that side. I mean, you know, uh, you know she's averaging thirty with the bat, twenty two with the ball. And I guess you can see a bit why she's a test specialist, and that there's she's putting a lot of action on the ball, uh, and that's and that's I guess probably more advantageous when you you know need to get wickets uh uh through you know through skill and guile rather than through you know hoping someone someone hits out but yeah this was just it was just another really good good game of of, of test cricket and one that actually almost looks uh sort of that India dominates it more than they than it felt like during the game I think you know they when it's you know, taken the first things they did almost 200 winning it by almost eight wickets but there was at one point in their first innings when they're 274 for seven. You're like, oh, okay, Australia could keep this lead under 100. And Steve Sharma, who season through with 70, uh, 78 to, you know, to over 400 in that first innings. And that, that was sort of the sort of story of the first innings was that Australia had a lot of people get in, but get out sort of below 40, I guess. Whereas India had, what, five players make between, six players make between 40 and 80. And that drove them there. And then the second innings, actually, Australia were 206 for three. So you think, oh, okay, they could set something in the realms of, 150, 180, and we'd seen a bit of low bounce on day one, actually, and you're like, oh, okay, this could get really hard to bat late in the test. It didn't quite break up, maybe, as as had been expected, but yeah, then you just blow away the tail and then knock off the runs fairly comfortably. And, you know, you'd have to say that, you know, a very small sample size, but they look like if there were a women's test championship, there would probably be favourites for it. And there have been some sort of, rumblings that maybe we could see more women's test cricket nick cockley at he's the ceo of cricket australia saying that they would be willing to hear the conversation to play three test series for marquee tours which i guess would be england's and india's and that would be 
uh, I'd, I'd love to see a three test women's test series and it's slowly building pace when you think about it's not that long ago that it was really just England Australia that were playing it and now a few more countries sort of rousing themselves and and get, now that you know we're getting results and entertaining games that will only continue to build you think mm, definitely um right before we move on to um the questions uh we've got two pre-recorded interviews the first is with matt roller from espn quick info on everything ipl auction related uh so pat cummins and mitch stark went for record-breaking sums of money last week while a few high-profile english players went unpicked so here is matt to answer all of your ipl auction related questions um matt not one but two australian world cup winners uh broke the all-time record for the most expensive purchases in an ipl auction first pat cummins then Mitchell Stark. How well do you think they'll do? Because Pat Cummins is is sort of a known quantity in IPLs. He's played quite a lot. His record is fine without being outstanding. Whereas Mitchell Stark is someone who's not actually played that much T20 cricket full stop since he last played in the IPL, really, which is which is nearly a decade ago. He's only played 38 games in eight years. So why have those two guys gone for so much money? Well, yeah, it, I mean, Stark um, didn't play in Australia's final game of the T20 World Cup in 2022, which they needed to win um, to go through and win handsomely. And they decided to pick Kane Richardson instead. So it's quite a turnaround for him to suddenly, um, you know, 12 months down the line, be the most expensive buy in IPL history. Um, I, I think in terms of why they've gone well, it's pretty obvious that they've they both had good World Cups. Um, in Stark's case, I think he's been someone that a lot of IPL teams have sort of wished would have been available for a long time uh, and, and hasn't been. And in Cummins' case, uh, his stock has clearly risen a lot over the past um, 12, 24 months. Um, but to be honest, I think I think the main thing is um, these mini auctions. You know, I, I think it's easy for people to see that players have been sold or unsold at the IPL and they think that, they sort of get the idea that the franchise owners sit down in a room and draw up a list of who do we think are the most are the best T20 players in the world in order, when actually it's nothing really like that. It's a load of teams sat there acting in their own self-interests um, and filling gaps in their squads. I mean, the majority of franchises retained in the region of, what, 15 to 18 players from their squads last year. Maximum score size is 25, so they had a few gaps to fill. Um, and the majority of teams would have ranked Stark and Cummins as the, the standout fast bowlers in that auction. It's not like franchises are saying, you know, we think Mitchell Stark is six times the T20 bowler that Chris Wokes is. It's a case of um, supply and demand. And, and I think Cummins is quite a good case study, really. It, it, you know, if you take it in isolation, as you say, it looks, you know, hardly believable. I'm not doubting his calibre as a captain or an all format cricketer, but in T twenty alone, as you say, you know, last time we played in the IPL, he was he was in and out of the side for KKR and went at ten and over. Um but if you look at what the two teams that were bidding for him wanted, it starts to make a bit more sense. Well RCB, uh who who were sort of the runners up, I suppose, in that lot, needed an overseas fast bowler, um, because Josh Hazelwood's unavailable for most of the season. They said openly afterwards their top three options were Stark Cummins and Alzari Joseph. They had money left and they were willing to, you know, potentially compromise on some other buyers to, to lock that player in. And then Sunrisers, who bought him in the end, at the start of the auction, they bought Head for 6.8 crore um, and Hasaranga for 1.5, which was a bit of a bargain. So they might have allocated more like 15 crore between those two. Um, by the stage, Cummins' lot came up. They had 21 players in the squad out of a possible 25. They only had one overseas spot left. Um, you know, they identified their top target and thought, why not just just use all of their budget on it. Um, it's not like in the context of the cash that is around in the IPL, if you look at TV deals, what the franchises are worth, an extra, um, you know, a couple of hundred thousand uh, Australian dollars is going to make much of a difference to the owners. So why not throw all your money at your top target? Um, and yeah, every chance he, he captains them and does very well. Mm. Um, there were hints of World Cup recency bias elsewhere. Uh, Daryl Mitchell, someone who's barely played in the IPL, he will be 33 at the start of the competition, not got an incredible T20 record behind him. He went for a whopping 14 crore to CSK. Um, T20 is such a data-driven format. And during the World Cup, a lot of people were talking about how the two white ball um, formats have perhaps been conflated too much. Why is there so much put on World Cup performances? Is is it as simple as recency bias? Because, you know, you look at some of the batters who weren't picked up or went for much, much less money. You wouldn't say that Mitchell is, is markedly um, 
more impressive as a T20 player? Yeah, I, I think there's a certain element of that, um, undoubtedly. I mean, every franchise, every owner, every coach, every assistant coach, every analyst will have watched every game or, you know, the majority of games at that World Cup and will be, you know, whether or not intentionally so, will be very aware of the fact that Daryl Mitchell has had a very good tournament in Indian conditions. And I suppose that is the particular relevance of the 50 over World Cup, despite the difference in format, um, is that if you're consistently performing against, you know, the best teams in the world over a, a six-week block in 50 over cricket, there's clearly going to be some some transferability there. And I, I think particularly, you know, it was it, I actually thought that Mitchell innings in the semi-final of the 50 over World Cup, bit of a tangent, was one of the innings of the tournament and hardly had a, a word written about it or um, anything the next day because it, it sort of um, paled in comparison to the uh, Indian juggernaut rolling on towards the final. But um, yeah, cl- clearly there's a, there's a huge element of that. I mean, Travis Head's T20 record is... Uh, nothing at all to speak of in the last three years. I think he's got one half century in that time. But um, you know, we we all use our eyes as well as our um, as well as crunching the numbers. And uh, I think most people would say that while well, Travis said you can't expect him to to be peeling off a hundred every IPL game, he plays like he did in the World Cup knockouts. Um, you also probably recognise that he's better. He's probably a better cricketer than his recent T Twenty record suggests. So. There's probably a happy medium to be struck between the, the numbers and the eye test. Um, there might be, there might still be a, a phase of evolution in the IPL, or maybe in ten years' time, we'll look back on some of these buyers and think, "What on earth were they doing?" Obviously, none of that was going to work. Um, but you can see why teams fall into the temptation of seeing um, players play very well against leading bowling attacks in the world in relevant conditions, um, and then, yeah, decide that they're the they're the player they want. Mm. Um... I'm going to ask you about a couple of English players who who weren't picked up in the auction. Uh, about half an hour ago, we got a press release in saying that Adil Rashid has gone to the top of the T20I bowling rankings. He's someone who um, I think English fans have been uh, con- confused as to why he's got so few IPL deals over the years. And I guess what is often said is that there are so many high quality domestic uh, wrist spinners uh, that overseas wrist spinners aren't valued as much as, as maybe... Um, fast bowlers, perhaps. But I look yeah, at some I, of the squads there. I look some look at some of the squads in the in after this auction that that look short on high quality spin. You know, Tom Curran, for example, got picked up by by RCB for one point five crore. Rashid's um, base price is two crore, and RCB had money left in their purse at the end of the competition. And, and I wouldn't say RCB have a high quality wrist spinner in their squad. Mumbai in a similar situation. Um, you know, we know how good Rashid is. Why is it that he's he's so rarely gets a go in the IPL? I I, I think um, as you say, it, it's mainly about the sort of dynamics of of players and player types almost who are, who are picked up. If, I think if you look at this auction, there were very very few bids on on overseas spinners. Full stop. And someone like Wanindu Hasaranga, who is probably easier to sort of fit into a team in that he he can probably bat a couple of spots higher than Rashid. You know, he went at his base price of, of 1.5 crore, which is hardly anything in the context of some some of the salaries that went around. I think a lot of the times, I, I, you know, IPL teams will sort of identify what they think their starting balance is going to be. So whether that's two overseas batters and two fast bowlers, whether that's three overseas batters and one overseas fast bowler, and very rarely will a team, you know, with possible exception of probably Gujarat Titans um, with Rashid Khan there, very rarely does does that seem to include a sort of frontline overseas spinner um, who's not going to contribute with the bat. So um, I, I I think Rashid is probably unfortunate. He's probably um, you know he he had an, he didn't have an amazing IPL season for Sunrisers this year. He didn't get many opportunities either. So that may be counted against him. And I suppose also you know there's there's an extent to which having put his base price at two crore and being a bit of a known entity, maybe that counts against him in some some respects. You can see why it might be attractive to a franchise to try and sign a, a mystery spinner and someone like Nur Ahmed, for example, gets a gig. He's probably a bit cheaper than Rashid. Um, he, he probably offers something a bit different as the left arm wrist spin option and um, is it, sort of, yeah, the, the idea of having a potential and high upside is quite attractive, whereas... Rashid is probably a bit more of a known entity, but yeah, he's, he's definitely unfortunate not to have played a lot more than he has in the IPL. And is, is Phil Salt unfortunate not to get a gig given given the form he's in? Yeah, absolutely. He had a, a, a pretty good season for Delhi last year. 
Um, and and I, I thought, to be honest, more than even more unfortunate than him being unsold was just being released in the first place. Um, he, he basically got an opportunity because firstly, Richard Pam wasn't there because of his car accident. And, and secondly, because Priffy Shaw was horribly out of form, which meant that he came into the side and then he sort of changed their overseas balance after, I think, five or six games. Um, but Salt did really well. So, yeah, un- unlucky not to not to be retained there. And um, I, I think if you look around, again, there wasn't much demand for uh, for top order batters uh, in this auction, particularly ones who didn't bowl, particularly right-handers as well. There are a couple of teams, I think, some risers with head made mention of the fact that they they felt they needed more left-handers last year because they were easy to line up. Um, so, yeah, so, so really unfortunate, I think, will be one of the top picks as a replacement uh, this year. There will inevitably be some injuries around. Um, and you'd think, especially in the context of back-to-back T20-100s, he'll be... He's probably one of the most unfortunate players to miss out. So um, with the T20 World Cup coming out, I'm sure he'll be desperate to um, get himself out there as a replacement. And I'm, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he ends up playing, you know, half an IPL season at least, despite the fact he doesn't currently have a contract. Mm. Um, another trend, I guess, from this auction was that there were some young Indian players who people might not have heard that much about going for quite a lot of money. So Samir Rizvi uh, Chennai, um, he he's their fifth most expensive player on their books at the moment, in between Moeen and Dhoni. Um, there was also Kumar Kushagra, 19-year-old wicketkeeper at Delhi. He's their fourth most expensive player at 7.2 uh, crore. I guess it's quite interesting that players with with basically no professional records are going for, for so much money, right? Without going into the individual backstories of these different players, um, why, why do you think those players are valued so highly? Well, I think partly there wasn't a huge amount of top domestic talent uh, available at the auction this year. So um, it probably made sense that teams were looking to sort of uh, to use their scouting networks and to um, try and find a, a hidden gem rather than going for known entities who are in their 30s and, um, you know, been been sort of proven non-performers, if you like, at IPL level. Um but I think one of the other trends that we've seen is that a lot of these sort of smaller T20 leagues that exist now in India um, are, are reaching a point where they're a little bit more professional and more to the point they're, they're televised. So they're easy for scouts to be able to actually watch and access in a way that they weren't previously. So, um, you know, in the sort of early days of the IPL, if you weren't performing in the uh, Syed Mushtakali trophy, um, where not every game is on t- it was on TV, then it, it might have been quite hard to actually get get in front of anyone, get anyone relevant seeing you bat. Whereas now, you know, you can you can be a a teenager playing in the Uttar Pradesh T20 League or in the Tamil Nadu Premier League. Um and, and people are able to watch it at the, the click of a button. So clearly the the sort of scouting network has evolved. So yeah, there, there was some huge money sloshing about for some players that might not even you know, hardly feature next year. There's no guarantee that someone like someone like Sammy Rizvi will break into a, a title winning Chennai squad. But um, you know, maybe they're hoping that um they can they can form a bit of relationship with him and down the line, obviously there's a mega auction next year, so it might be tricky to keep hold of him. But um, you know, maybe they'll they'll sneak him through as their their lowest prize retention if they think he's something really special and um yeah, see whether he's he's a guy with a big future or not. There's also I should also point out at this stage that there's also a big history of it, random uncapped Indian players going for big money in IPL auctions and then never really doing anything. So <laughs> it's not a guarantee that just because he's gone for a lot of money that he's going to be the next superstar. Yeah, I, I just find the pay dynamics really interesting in that you've got some players like Rinku Singh who may well be starting for India in the T20 World Cup that takes place weeks after the IPL. He's on something like 10 times less money than some of these kids who've barely played professional cricket because uh, KKR got him on a, on a good deal last year, a good bit of scouting, etc. cetera. Um, I, yeah, I find that really interesting. Um, just finally, what are your thoughts on the overall, what, what, the, what the squads look like? Who do you think, now you, now you know who will be playing for everyone, who, do, who looks strongest on paper, do you think? Well, I, I think the auction has, has served its purpose to a large extent in that I think the squads look generally quite, um, you know, you can sort of plot a route for the majority of teams as to how they would go well. Um, the, the sides that sort of stood out, I think um, Mumbai Indians were, I think they finished third in the end last year because they, they won the first knockout match and then uh, fell short of reaching the final. But they, they did that with sort of a, a scratch bowling attack. Um, so with that trade of Hardik Pandya coming in and effectively replacing Cameron Green, 
that's opened up a much an ability to field two overseas fast bowlers in every game. They'll probably go in with potentially Gerald Kurtzier and Dulshan Madashanka, along with Jasper Boomer, who's back from injury. So that looks like a seriously strong team. Um, the other one that sort of stood out to me was Rajasthan. I think they they obviously just missed out on the playoffs last year, came second the year before that. Um, but they look a really strong side to me. I think it's a, a similar core. Um, Rian Parag, who's a sort of perennial underachiever at IPL level, but very, very good in domestic cricket, has had another good year in uh, in the side, Mr. Kali Trophy. Um, and yeah, Rothman Powell, I think, is a, a pretty good signing there as a another finisher, along with Shimron Hetmeyer. I expect both of those will probably start um, in the early stage of the tournament. So those are the those are the two teams that sort of stood out. But obviously, you know, Chennai and Gujarat have. Uh, reached the final last year and have got pretty similar cause and um, yeah there are a few sides where you can sort of plot a plot a route for them to be very successful um, and finally just on Rajasthan there's the name of uh, Tom Kola Kadmo an uncapped English player it's not that often that you see uncapped English players picked up in the IPL you spoke to him recently he's had a low-key really good year sort of at the, at the, at the B tier tournaments yeah, he, he's um he's someone where whenever you click on a school card um of a, a random T Twenty league on on ESPN Crick Info, you can generally see his name um and often sort of springing up for several different teams in the same week. It feels like I think he did have a week at the start of this year where he played for three teams in the space of eight or nine days, um in three different leagues. He, he yeah he's he's become um he's had a slightly you know he's had a a slightly strange career obviously um he left Worcester under a, a, a cloud and was involved in that um case back in the day um then he, he sort of had a bit of time at Yorkshire he's, he's he's unusual I suppose at the age of 29 and having played for three different counties um but in the winters yeah rather than the sort of the old lot of the uncapped English player of hoping to get on a Lions tour or playing some great cricket overseas he sort of tours around South Asia scores runs for fun and <clears throat> has become one of the sort of unlikely stars of the Abu Dhabi T10 as well. I know that's a, a favourite of pod listeners, but he's the is the second highest run scorer in Abu Dhabi T10 history, which is, oh. um, you know, a noble status to hold, of course. Um, but yeah, teams are clearly noticing and uh, yeah, good good news for him. I think he'll be the, the backup to Joss Butler to start with, but, you know, he's probably an injury away from getting a real crack at it on the big stage. And also, he's a, he's a proper middle order batter as well. He's not necessarily a lot, a lot of the uh, highly rated young English uncapped players tend to be openers. He's someone who does a lot of his business in the middle order. Um, yeah. 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 Um, cheers for your time, Matt. Uh, much appreciated. Catch you soon. And next, we have a chat with John Speller, uh, a Labour member of Parliament who is tabling a bill in the new year that seeks to, among other things, ensure that Test cricket played in England is on free to air television for the first time in nearly 20 years. Um, here is Speller on his reasons behind putting the bill forward. Um, it, it wouldn't be a Christmas special without getting an MP on. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a very warm welcome to John Speller, MP, who has been in the news recently for um, proposing for home English test cricket to be um, on free to air television, something that has not been a regular occurrence for coming up to 20 years now. Not so the 2005 Ashes um, has test cricket regularly been on free-to-air television in the UK. John, great to have you on the show. Um, yeah. First of all, for those of us uh, not particularly familiar with parliamentary procedure, what does this bill mean and what needs to happen for it to pass? How likely would it be, et cetera, et cetera? Well, it's a once termed a private member's bill. And so it will have uh, its first uh, outing on the 22nd of March. And what I'll be trying to do then is the government may well block it and they'd be, uh, they'd be able to at, at that stage. What I'm wanting to do is put pressure on them and actually also get people in the cricketing world to put pressure on them to say, look, you need to reconsider. Because my concern is that uh, I understand the argument for the cricket authorities that they are getting money into the game. But I fear that this might be short sighted. Because while they're making the money now, they're not maintaining and certainly not growing the spectator and support base, but also not providing that degree of excitement and encouragement for youngsters to go on to be the players of the future as well. So in a sense, hollowing out for the future, even if they're making money in the short term. Hmm. Um, so what's your motivation behind putting it together? Because you yourself have quite an interesting relationship with cricket in terms of when, when your interest peaked, etc. 
Well, um, I've, you know, I, I go less less now. It's all a question of time. I'm not sort of asking for sympathy for an MP's uh, life and life and life and workload. Um, but my uh, my great my grandmother's brother actually played for uh, for Kent in England, and uh, Colin Blythe um, discovered up, up on Blackheath, um, and then went on to still have I think the largest number of wickets in one day, seventeen against Northampton for the for the least number of runs. And indeed, there's the memorial down at uh, down at the St Lawrence Cricket Ground in uh, in Canterbury. The war memorial, but it's specifically Colin Bly. So obviously there was an interest in the uh, in the family on that, and I, you know, sort of followed followed that on. I, I would certainly not claim that the DNA passed down to me in uh, in any re any regard of being able to play, but at the same at the same time certainly had a, had an interest and uh, you know try and get down several times to Kent during the during the course of a season. But my concern is broader than that. And I've also got something about rugby union because, you know, there's football all the time on, uh, on, on, on television. And that's uh, that's good for the audiences. But it's also uh, good for encouraging youngsters to want to participate in the game. And if we don't have that level of visibility, I'm not sure that the players of the future are going to see cricket as the area in which they'll uh, in, uh, exercise their sporting prowess i suspect they may go off to other games i think that would be a loss mm. to um to the to britain i think it would be a loss to our to our culture mm. um there is some cricket on free to air television as it is today test highlights uh, the, the hundred the occasional limited overs international mm. so are you worried specifically about test cricket's future um or or is it also that Test cricket for you is still the, the best vehicle for, for generating interest among people who are not into cricket previously. I think it's very important that cricket is broad spectrum. Um, I fully understand the attraction to the clubs and to the television of the shorter versions of the game. It appeals to me less, but I absolutely accept that this gets the uh, gets the crowds in. But if we're looking at cricket as um, you know as an art and as a uh, as a, as a, a long term sport, I think we have to look at the longer game, at the county games. But also, I would see Test match cricket as really the top of the pyramid, top mm. of the food chain in terms of in terms of the art of uh, of, of cricket. And I think uh, to lose that would be uh, would be unfortunate. And then I think we will, you know, we could steadily see hollowing out in a number of our our, our competitor countries. You know, um, the West Indies, for example, have uh, at times been incredibly exciting and competitive, but that is slipping away a bit now. Partly, I think, because some of the other uh, countries can pay such bigger sums for their players to participate. But I think we will be losing something then. And I, I think, interestingly and ironically. At a time when cricket worldwide is on the increase, look at the developments that are taking place in the United States. Actually, in Texas, building a whole new cricket stadium, um, a lot of it based on uh, Indian diaspora coming and working in the in the high tech in, in, in industries. So, I would not like to see that in the home of cricket being hol being hol hollowed out. I think it's a big part of our national sporting culture. I think it's worth preserving. Mm. Um, the, the counter to, to having free to air test match cricket would be that Sky invest an enormous amount of money into the game that filters down to recreational levels. So I, I think Sky would claim that um, a, a quarter of a billion pounds since 2017 has gone back into the recreational game. And that comes from the subscriptions that people pay them. Um, is, is there a concern about what would happen without that money if all test matches in England are on free to air television? I understand it's uh, it's right and necessary to uh, to try and get a balance balance here, and I I accept that um, the payments into sport into various sports, but including cricket, have uh, filtered down to grassroots uh, grassroots cricket and have helped to uh, help to sustain. My concern is as to whether that is basically mining the cricket supporter base uh, rather than farming and growing it. And looking forward, then is there a danger that uh, younger people taking an interest in sport, cricket will pass them by? And so, yes, we may get the money now, but whether that will flow through in future.
years as the uh, support, supporter interest wanes. So we've seen how certain games have declined in uh, in, in popularity and maybe on a da- on a downward trend. There may be a short term burst of uh, money going into, into into a game, but you can sometimes see long term long term decline. Absolutely, except there's got to be a balance, right? I think that the uh, the test matches are an important part of maintaining that interest and also maintaining a, a national feeling, you know, of people all watching the same match and cheering on England um at the same at the same time. I think that's worth I think that's worth preserving, but building on as building on as well. I just think the authorities need to reflect and if they're not, that's why I'm asking the government to intervene. Mm. Um we're guilty of, of basically only looking within cricket um, and we don't often look at other sports, perhaps. Um, do you think there are examples and learnings that cricket might get from other sports, both both sports that have done pretty well recently and, and sports that uh, might have declined in popularity a little bit? Well, I think sports that have grown and uh, grown in interest and grown their supporter base. I mean, um, you know, look at the success of darts in uh, becoming popular, not just in the UK, interesting enough, but that's also helped to grow support in a number of other countries, notably uh, notably Holland. Um, and that's been a skillful presentation and, mar- and marketing, but really working hard to build up the uh, support base, which has then rippled down into, uh, into players as well. That's absolutely right that we've got to maintain the venues for this. And the decline of local pubs it might be worrying with regard to with regard to darts, but equally a lot of that I would have thought is based on the from the Hearn organisation, based on the work they did in growing interest in snooker as well. And again, it wasn't just confined to our shores; they found a formula that actually expanded interest in snooker in other in other countries as well. I think that's that's where the, you get the balance right with some entrepreneurial flair. Um, but a desire for a lo- building a long-term base rather than just a short-term gain. Mm. Um, you mentioned at the start that you uh, want cricket to put to put pressure um, to, to support you in, in what you're trying to do. What would you uh, recommend people listening to this? Uh, if, they, if they agree with you, they like what you're saying, what would you uh, suggest they do? Well, the best thing they can do is write to their own member of parliament and say, look, we understand this bill is, bill is up. We understand it would need some government time in order to uh, to take it, or some support from the government to uh, to take it through. Um, and therefore, would you indicate to ministers in uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport that you, you think this is a good idea and it's one that ought to be ought to be taken forward? Um, that's that's what really helps to move things along. Doesn't necessarily mean that it will be on the statute book by the time of the general election. But it starts to get the message through to ministers who may or may not be there after the general election and civil servants in the department who probably will be. And so therefore, we need to get that message across that the public have noticed this and therefore they they understand the need to reset the balance and to um, and to therefore for the benefit of the public, but ultimately long term of the sports concern themselves. Mm. Well, John, it's been a pleasure speaking to you best of luck with the bill um have a great christmas thank you very much right uh to finish off the show for the year we've got your questions and your moments of the year uh the first question is from harry who asks hello team loved the last episode it was my first listen in ages due to testing positive for endless cricket syndrome uh, my question will my question is will this be the year that jimmy retires and robo usurps him as England's primary seamer in test cricket. Um, Butch, it's an interesting question, I guess, because when you're listing off how many tests every team has next year, you fast forward what 17 tests looks like on various players' careers. You know, young players, youngish players like Crawley and Pope will have played like 54 test matches, something mm. around that, by this time next year. So you're sort of you're trying to work out what does that mean for different different players. Um, and in the seam bowling department, obviously, Broad's just retired. Uh, Anderson will be 42 next this time next year. You can expect a, a reasonable amount of change there. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, there's the spectre of, um, or the, the delicious prospect of, of maybe seeing Joffre Archer come back and play. Now, I know we, we've moved on to talking about test matches, but England are a Joffre Archer away from being a, a pretty hot white ball side, if you ask me, but that's, a, that's another thing. 
Um, I, you know what? I don't know. I mean, if you rewind back to about maybe two or three years ago when Jimmy was struggling with that sort of like shoulder blade and, and, and shoulder injury or whatever it was, I'd never have had him play in the Ashes this year at home. So I, I do... I do think there has to be that, that at some point you're going to have to sort of say that, uh, you know, enough's enough because I don't think he's going to retire. The, the <laughs> ideal time to have done it would have been at the Oval with Brody, but he, he, you know, he turned his nose up at that. You know, it's it's not incumbent upon anybody to, to, to walk away if, they, if they're still able to perform. But, you know, you, you get to the point where 17 test matches coming up during the summer, you know for a fact that, that Jimmy, even even if it was only 13, you would be sort of saying, well, he, you wouldn't want him to be to be playing them all. Um, and how much how much time do you sort of spend looking after somebody that hasn't got very much, much longer left as opposed to plugging in experience to people who have an entire career in front of them? So... It, it would not surprise me if it wasn't some at uh, some point during this year, maybe at the end of the English summer, that that, um, that Jimmy calls it a day. But I've been I've I've made a career out of being wrong about Jim, so um, long they may, may that continue. <laughs> um, Ben, we've got a pretty good idea of who the new seamers are, given who's got contracts, etc. Do you think there's anyone not on that list of of central contract or fast bowling development contracts who we might see in a test shirt? I mean, seven, seventeen test matches is just a lot. Hell of a lot. Yeah, I guess if, if you're looking for someone who could have a Matt Potts like um, Bolt from from the near blue, maybe Tom Laws could be that player. I mean, they like him a lot at Surrey um, and, uh, you know, o- o- on that Lions tour, um, possibly. But they, they have give they have blooded so many players that it's, it's times when, when sort of when Matt Potts plays, you're like, hang on, this is almost like the seventh or eighth choice seamer who's now playing. And so you'd be, have to get down to the, almost the, the ninth or tenth to get to get blown. But yeah, it'll be interesting how they handle. I mean, you know, they've been handling the transition for so long, and that's it's almost why I don't mind, you know, Anderson kind of calling time on his own because he can, you know, surely that is a good thing for a young fast bowler who comes in. If Anderson's playing one or two tests out of three in a series, they're around Anderson that whole time. He's showing them stuff in the nets. Um, he's almost like England's de facto bowling coach in a way. Um, so, which I think yeah, he will guess, be once he calls it a day, anyway. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess you know, I, I still like Potts a lot. I mean, they it's it's what he, he needs to improve one of several things a tiny bit to be a real, real threat in a lot of conditions. And he's such a hardworking, sensible guy that I think that he will find a way to to do that. I mean, he just that's how he got into the inside in the first place, just by you know by that kind of relentless improvement and I can see how an attack of Potts, Robinson and then a speedster actually becomes quite a threatening one but um and then yeah you know the speedster could be you know got tongue you got wood there, there's 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 interesting things there but I don't know if we'll see who the next fast bowling debutant will be I guess we didn't get to see John Turner and what he's all about in the West Indies as well which is a bit of a shame but yeah yeah, keep an I eye, guess Sam Cook can never the, be that far away. Sam, well, Sam Cook has, has kind of been, you know, the Jimmy understudy forever, hasn't he? And you know, we're getting to the point now where he's he's running out of time. Well, White um, was the answer. Uh, Josh Josh Hull's another one. To keep an eye on from. Um, Leicester. Is he still at Leicester? He hasn't signed somewhere else. Yeah, still Leicester. Leicester. Um, <laughs> I, I was, I was, was going to say he's impressed with what little I saw of him last year, and he gets another another year older, another year stronger, and um, you know, left armour as well. So, and if we're talking yeah, about there, there points, are quite. Then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> say again. If we're talking about release points, then Josh Josh Hull uh, ranks quite pretty highly on that. Right, he's got he's yeah. got a bit of Bruce Reed in there, hasn't he, in terms of height and, and the rest of it. But anyway, I mean, look, the England have they're they're in quite a in quite good shape in that they've got a lot of a lot of players without a massive amount of experience are kind of waiting to get some. Um, but uh, you know, Chris Wokes, of course, is is will only be taking part. In, in home test matches, we we think <laughs> we're pretty sure that that's going to be the case. Um, and so there's going to be a, there's going to be a couple of big holes in um, in what England's first choice bowling attack looks like at home anyway, with with no broad, um, which puts extra onus on Jimmy to play more test matches. And you're kind of thinking, well, how many how many can he play? So all of that, all of that in the end, um, points towards a, 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 some sort of fanfare at the end of the summer. You would think. Mm. Um, I wasn't planning on bringing up Chris Wokes on this week's show after what happened last week. Um, <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, a question directed uh, at Butch. Toby asks, 
every England, every ex England international under the sun has basically said if they were part of the Basball side now, they would have performed so much better. Does Butch think he would have performed significantly better under this regime? Um, well, I mean, the thing is that the the, the whole Basball ethos is kind of how I how I it seemed to seem to sort of fit in very well with how I prepared for for Test match cricket back in the day. It was just that nobody else did it, so I, I you know, I, you know <laughs> I, I'd be. I'd be fitting in no problem at all. I mean, look, you, you don't know. The only the only reason that you would imagine uh, it, it would be a lot more fun. You know, I can I remember playing. The difference between playing in the in the, the, the end of the nineties when I first started to play, um, whereby it was it was it was almost terrifying in terms of sort of like the pressure and the, the dressing room was not a wasn't a fun place to be. Not because people weren't good guys or weren't sort of, but they were just had to be so. Um, so turned inwards on their own performance that it wasn't really much of a sort of a team atmosphere and stuff. And that doesn't help. Um, but, you know, by the, by the sort of the, the second time that I played, things had become a lot more relaxed and a lot more fun. Um, but, I mean, who knows? You know, the, the, these guys these guys are playing in a way that none of us could play in because, you know, the, they're kind of bringing a lot of the, the T20, um, you know the high strike rate sort of type cricket to to test matches. So, so just to say that simply all you had to do was to, to be in the dressing room and suddenly you'd be playing basketball is not is not necessarily the, the case. Although I suppose if you were going to get picked, you'd had to have been scoring a lot of runs in T Twenty cricket. So you can see how it all follows. But I, I think that the, the the main point is is that for for people to perform at their best, they need to feel very relaxed, very welcomed, and, and very much as though you're not playing with the sword of Damocles swinging over your head. Um, that was the case in the in the 90s. It was less the case in the early 2000s, and it's gone to the nth degree um, with, with with Baz and, and Ben. And, and there's no doubt about it. In whatever job you're doing, the more fun you're having, the, 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 the more chance you have of doing it better. Um, and uh, And so that is certainly the case. So, yes. <laughs> um, the next question is directed uh, at Ben uh, Darren asks what fairly simple law change would you make to improve the game in 2024 but do you think this is a time for us to, to recharge our vessels <laughs> um, the, yeah the, there are a few when I saw this question coming that came to mind I was thinking oh, what just one but I think the uh, the main one that's it's almost like a like a ticking time bomb that whenever it happens people say Oh, what's going to happen when this happens, you know, the last ball of the World Cup final or whatever, is that law around uh, the ball going dead as soon as the umpire makes a decision. So say a batter is hit on the pad, um, it goes down the leg side for four buys, but the umpire gives it LBW um, and then they review it and it reveals that it wasn't actually LBW, but you don't get those four runs back. I would basically like to see it that... Uh, the umpire um, just delays until the end of a passage of play to, to give whatever decision they would, which wouldn't, you know, most of the time when there's a, a court behind appeal, say it's edged to the slip and that's when the ball is dead or it's edged to keep that's when the ball is dead or uh, when the ball hits the pads, you know, the batter aren't this different single. So this would only come into play, not that regular. It's not, it wouldn't be a huge change, but it would make a big difference in some very specific circumstances. And it would also, I think, close what is actually a bit of a loophole at the moment that it's supposed to be that as soon as the instant of the impact which caused the decision that's when the ball is dead so when the ball hits the pad if the umpire raised the finger the ball is considered dead from the moment it hit the pad right but you have this odd situation at the moment where uh say a batter plays forward it instead of onto their pad and it balloons up to you know slip or wherever um if the umpire gives that lbw and then it's reviewed, and then you have it so that then they realise it hit the bat, then that can still be out court, even though mm. it should have been dead from the moment it hit the pad, but it had to come back alive to be caught, if that makes sense. Um, so that's that's the rule I'd change. And I think actually the uh, the introduction of DRS has probably had a few sort of unintended consequences on that kind of dead ball law. I mean, we saw it in that, um, uh, in that game that was one with a six that was then realised to be a no ball afterwards, but the ball of no ball came after the ball had gone for six because that's how they call no balls now. And so, again, in the rules, it says the run scored for no ball comes when the no ball signal is made, not when the bowler oversteps kind of thing. Uh, and there's a few of those things that wouldn't have mattered before and now do because of 
the kind of the interplay between DRS and and when the ball is dead. And I think that could just do with a bit of looking at in general, I suppose. Um, Butch, are you aware that Ben basically got one of the laws changed early this year? I, no, I wasn't aware of that. Well, which which um, one was so it, it was, dare I ask? Uh, it, was, <laughs> it, it, was, it was Mankad's. Um, so it was it was during the BBL last year where Adam Zampa attempted a mancad but had gone basically entirely through his action, yeah. and then he attempted to take the bells off. And basically, there was some wording that wasn't a hundred percent explicit over what it meant of of the, the expected point of release or something like that. And Ben um, asked a few questions. Then language language, the is language is important. Language is important. Yeah, it yeah. is. And um, yeah. the MCC subsequently. Uh, released a slight amendment to the to the law. Mm. I think that's right. Um, next up, uh, Andrew asks: uh, After England's recent defeat, it got me thinking about modern fast bowling and the skills for each format. Uh, both current brothers burst onto the scene as Red Bull players initially, but quickly got sucked into the White Ball franchise circuit, meaning uh, their ability to 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 learn their craft through repetition at county level went down. This has resulted in Tom falling off completely as a Red Bull prospect and Sam never having been able to nail down any consistency in the Red Bull format over the last couple of years. I'm not saying it won't work out for either Curran brother, but their inconsistency in their runs in the England side combined with a lack of consistent Red Bull experience has stunted their development to an extent. With T20 cricket, the 100 and various scheduling issues, um, the likes of the new breed of Tongue, Atkinson and Turner, they will predominantly learn how to bowl an ODI and test cricket on the international s- stage like Sam did, for example. Will this be a new trend moving forwards, whereby bowlers will not have the requisite skills to fall back on moving forward in longer formats? All the best bowlers at the World Cup and in test cricket have a grounding in consistent Red Bull cricket. Mm. There seems to be less room for that now more than ever, and I fear it may have a detri- detrimental effect on fast bowling indefinitely. Um, yeah, lo- lots of interesting things touched on in that um, question. I, th- I think the, the broader point on sort of... So you, if you actually use Sam as an example, Sam actually played loads of first-class cricket before he um, started playing uh, test cricket and, and franchise mm. cricket, etc., um, I, I do think it is a concern for for bowlers going forward, just how little first class cricket a lot of the very top bowlers will end up playing. Because if you've got if you're a ninety mile per hour six foot four bowler, you're you're just not going to play that much of it because you're going to get hoovered up by the the franchise machine. Okay, well, well, look, okay, there there is there is a precedent for for, for players not playing a massive amount of first class cricket and going on to be the best red ball bowlers of all time. Um, Glenn McGrath would be one of those hardly played any matches for New South Wales, played nearly all of his cricket for Australia. Um, the, the, the main difference here, in the two, the two examples that he gives are slightly confusing because, it, 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 because by choice, Tom doesn't play any Red Bull cricket. And by dint of um, how thought after Sam is in White Bull cricket, he doesn't play any Red Bull cricket either. It's kind of, it's not a, it's not a, it's not as though there isn't any Red Bull cricket for either of them to play. There is. They just, Tom has decided he doesn't want to play it anymore. And Sam is, is so in demand in the white ball stuff, which is, you know, the, the issue around why he would choose to do that and not be slugging his guts out bowling bowling 80 overs a match for Surrey is a pretty straightforward one. It's a financial one. Um, and so there are lots of threads to, to, to what he is saying. What what I would say is is from a from a from an experience point of view, from my experience, right? There is a sweet spot in terms of the amount of overs that a bowler bowls for his county to sort of to to learn his trade, and then how much cricket he then plays internationally and not using his body or or taking um, taking toll on his body by bowling overs that don't matter as much playing for his county. So if I can give the example of somebody like Gus Fraser, I'm not sure how old our, our, our tweeter is, but somebody like Gus Fraser bowled all of his, nearly all of his best overs playing for Middlesex, hundreds and hundreds of them before hips and backs and everything got destroyed and, and played relatively very few of them playing for England. Now, somebody like Mark Atherton as captain in the, in the 90s and Graham Gooch before him would have killed for having Gus Fraser fit and fresh, the old Gus Fraser, the quick, bouncy, very, very relentlessly accurate Gus Fraser fit for the entirety of their captaincies 
bowling all of his best overs for England and not for Middlesex. Unfortunately, the way that the way that the game was back in those days, it meant it was the other way around. Whilst Glenn McGrath bowled played, I don't know, 10 games maybe for New South Wales. Might not have been as many as that before he played for Australia and then literally played for Australia for the rest of his career. Wasted no overs bowling, you know, endless overs playing county cricket, this, this, that and the other. All of his best stuff was saved for playing for Australia and it made him the best bowler. In, and he ended up being the best bowler in the world. So there is not a, there's not a right or wrong way of doing it, but there is a, definitely a sweet spot between the amount of time it takes to kind of to learn your skill then there is more learning to be done at international level. But physically, you need to be in the best shape of your life in order to play as much test match cricket as possible. And a lot of English bowlers who, sp- who, play- who played an enormous amount of county cricket found themselves knackered by the time they played in test matches. And that is a situation that you do not want to go back to, um, regardless of the, of the points that our man makes. Yeah, I, 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 that's quite interesting. I think one thing that we touched on quite a lot um, with with batting is, is how easy stroke difficult it is switching between formats when you have very little cricket played between your last T20 and your next first class mm. game. Um, someone like Ben Duckett is someone who who quite seamlessly goes between the three. He's got quite a similar setup and technique in all three formats. But I, I wonder, you know, actually watching this Safka India Test match, you got some bowlers who who had brilliant ODI World Cups, uh, players with good form and other formats have come into this test match and, and look really cold you know um i meant i mentioned last week that i read um the the, the frank worrell uh biography recently and you know they, they play 25 30 games <laughs> on each tour that you know you get so much they, they in, in the olden days you had so much um time to embed yourself in whatever conditions you're playing in adjusting exactly to what you're <laughs> Uh, counteracting whereas now players are hopping not just between conditions but also formats and that in itself is something that some players are just going to be better at than others and and we talk a lot um about batters struggling to adapt but actually i think the the same must apply to some bowlers and some will just be better um than others others at that Mm. i suppose uh, the the, the, the tom curran story to me is kind of fascinating and uh because Butch is right that he has now made the decision to step away from first class cricket. But to begin with it, I don't think it was like a conscious decision exactly. That was just what you did as a young cricketer. You sort of you sort of So we got so what you got selected for. Well well yeah, but but it's also that, you know, he 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 takes all the opportunities available to him in terms of all the white ball stuff. And then all of a sudden, just because he's doing that, he's not playing any first class cricket. And then it mm. gets to a stage where, well, I'm now not going to play this at all anymore. But, but, but to, so to begin with, it kind of wasn't a decision. It was just because you're a young cricketer. You want to take every opportunity available to you. You want to learn as much as you can. You want to also, it's different in terms of fast bowling versus batting because the risk of injury is so much greater, especially career ending one. So you can, for some of these guys, you might think if they actually sat on board pads financially, they might think, well, I can either go and play, you know, the, the, the US league or the CPL and earn like a quick buck now but I might think that actually, if I look at how England's panning out, and if I put my put my time in here, then I might be, you know, the guy who can play for five, six years for England, and that will also bring with it its rewards elsewhere. But when you're a fast bowler, you might think, well, actually, if I don't take this quick money right now, it could be, you know, I get I get a stretch fraction next year. All of a sudden, mm. I'm, I've forgotten I'm ne- never getting a franchise deal again. So it's so hard to think about as a fast bowler to balance all those things. And I guess that's why these development contracts, if they work as they should. That like you know it's it's obviously you know that bit of financial security is nice and it's about talking to the counties and saying you know keep this guy out of this game or we actually want this guy to play this game because we you know, want to see how we'll go against against this team or whatever it might be. Um, but also you hope there's a, a reasonable amount of kind of um, uh, of conversations that can be had with with young players who are making decisions that that are not at all simple and all of them are kind of understand when you look at the motivations that it's beyond more than just you know this guy loves t20 cricket or this guy loves money and is just trying to make mm. as much money as possible because actually what? it's not clear what decision is right in it for any of those things a lot of the time i think one one thing i think that that in order to kind of in in order to assuage the um what was the tweeter's name by the way that in order to kind of like to convince him that Players do not go into it thinking to themselves, "I'm going to, I'm going to specialise in this, that, or the other." I'm only interested in the money. You kind of, 
you end up where you end up. You know, you you skills wise, when you first sign a contract, say you're 16, 17, you're just trying to play as much of everything as you possibly can. Um, just the, the way that the sport has gone has, has forced people down um, sort of specialization uh, routes as opposed to sort of the players not wanting to to, to get the overs under their belt in first class, first class cricket. It's just, you know, the opportunities or the, the, the pool, the, the pools are so multiple now in so many different directions that there are lots of choices available to, to young, talented guys that just simply weren't there in the old days. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe the question you're asking is whether or not things would be better if we went back to that. Well, they might be for some, they might be for some teams, some nations, and they might not be for others. You know, again, I, I go back to, I go back, English cricket was the only professional game in, in, in town for a very long time. Did that make us a particularly good international team that won lots of tournaments and was the best test team in the world? No, it didn't. You know, <laughs> so in in many ways, we've, ne- we've never had it so good as we have now, as much as it's disappointing with the World Cup and, and the, the rest of it. And there are always things to moan about. But, you know, England has never, in my lifetime anyway, has never been successful ever at everything, let alone let alone just one, you know, World Cup or one um, Ashes series. This is, uh, this is, since the 2000s, this has been an incredible period for English cricket. And, and also in terms of what, what the game and what Test cricket actually is, change isn't necessarily a bad thing. So I think, you know, pe- people for, for, for 10, 15 years have bemoaned defensive technique for batters. Uh, people have criticised bowlers' ability to hit the same spot as much as they used to. That actually makes it quite watchable cricket, mm. you know. Like if 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 Test cricket is Test cricket is adapting, you know, it, it's you're not going to get the exact same skill set as you had 25, 30 years ago, and that doesn't mean that it's worse. It just means it, it's different. You yeah. know, this Test match is played yeah. on on it, this Test match in Centurion, you know, pretty spicy deck, and you know the best players are striking at seventy five, eighty on it. You know, you know that that is that is different really to what we we used to see someone who's you know we, we regard as quite nuggety and Dean is still <laughs> able to score quite quickly you know? I, I mean the, it's, a, it's a different game you're right and it doesn't mean the other works. the other side to that is that thing it's just things happen faster don't they I mean it's kind of you still got you've still got five days to complete the game five day test does not mean that the match should last for five days it's you've got five days to get it done um, and more often than not even even if there is weather or rain and stuff around five days is enough to to get a result, and that is that's not a bad thing, you know. Cricket is it's it's been very watchable, and it also means that if you if you do end up in a situation um, where there is a draw imminent, the draw is normally a, is a is a thrilling one. You know, people are hanging on for dear life, as opposed to one that you know where, where the teams have just sort of battered it battered each other into submission, and no one can take a wicket, and it's as dull as crap. So, you know, it's, you're right. It, everything's very different. People's expectations are different. Um, and, and the skill of the players in, in many ways is, is is very, very different, but in a, a much more front foot way than it used to be. Moving on to our moment of the year. Uh, ben, what's yours? Um, mine is watching Mark Wood's test comeback spell at Headingley when, you know, obviously with Mark Wood, you're always thinking, is this guy going to be the same guy? And within, you know, one ball, you realised he was. And then even then, he kept getting quicker and quicker through that, through that first <laughs> over. And, you know, it was something like the first 20... It might have been the first 24 balls he might have one run off the bat or or one scoring shot off the bat. And then, or maybe it was the first 22 balls he hadn't conceded a run off the bat and then went for a boundary and then took a wicket. It was something like that. And it was extraordinary. And it was also just the way the crowd was so um, like wrapped by it in a way that, you know, mm. normally when a crowd is wrapped by something in sports, you, you hear the noise rise. And here you basically heard it go like completely silent and you could almost hear the sound of, now, how many like twenty thousand eyeballs just looking towards the, uh, the 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 screen to see what the latest measure on the speed gun was <laughs> after each delivery? Uh, so that yeah, that that I mean, obviously that he ends up taking five wickets and he gets his reward kind of later. But it was actually that first spell on that first morning. Obviously, you know, England were two 0 down and sort of didn't feel like they were, but it also sort of did feel like they were. And uh, and then his arrival along with Chris Wokes, you know, changes the the complexion of the series and that was just just for pure watchability that was my moment of the year basically mm-hmm. very good uh butch what, good. About, what about you um blimey well i, I suppose in, in terms of full theater i guess two things one of them was was broad at the at the back end that last 45 minutes at, at the oval on uh that final day was was something that i'll never forget 
um, you know, being up in the in the gantries and in the crowd, just the atmosphere was incredible. And and the other one was was Johnny Best, <laughs> Johnny Best, those press conference um, after the Old Trafford Test match was was absolutely one for the ages. One of the most brilliant, the most brilliant moments of um, of sporting inquisitor. Uh, the Inquisitor getting getting some of the most delicious and extraordinary answers back that, that you've ever seen. A, a guy trying to vindicate himself and having had done so with the bat so brilliantly. But it was uh, if you haven't, if you never got the chance to hear it, people just just look it up because it's absolute gold. Yeah, I'm not sure if the full version exists Does online. It not? Um, I mean, it, you know, I'm the not, fact, I'm the not fact sure, that the man but... is basically so. It's so everyone, had, it, oh, yeah, everybody had basically said, well. You know, he's, he's been picked to keep wicket. We're not really sure he's fit enough to do the job. And, and it turned out in those first couple of test matches that the chances went down and he wasn't moving very well and all the rest of it. And then he came out and had a go at everybody for saying what, what he then said was patently true. I wasn't fit enough to do the job in the first place. Why are you having a go at me? <laughs> it was so good. Anyway, whatever's there, find it because it's because it's, it's well worth the admission fee um, in what was, you know, a stunning five test match series. And that was the icing on the cake for me. No, I, I remember being being sat, sat I sat through that that press conference, and and it was it was extraordinary because he did basically outline exactly what the criticisms <laughs> were, probably better than anyone else had articulated. Yeah. Um, and and also he sort of took aim at one journalist asked a pretty, um, uh, you know, inno- innocuous, n- not mean spirited at all question, and 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 Johnny's rebuttals along the lines of, "Why haven't you asked me if I'm okay?" Um, and uh, and I think that that I think journalists had be- before that it was it was, yeah. yeah that that was quite anyway we, we we love um, we have to have to have to make the point that this comes from a comes from a place of love because Johnny's a Johnny's a one one of a kind one off bloke. So my my moment of the year I think might have even been from the same day or maybe the day before that Bearstow press conference probably the day before actually. It was um, the partnership between Crawley and Moeen at Old Trafford. Um, Crawley, who, you know, everyone under the sun had been questioning his place in the side. Um, he he had a, a few positive moments in, in the first two test matches, but that obviously was the most emphatic um, way of, of silencing the downers as, as he could have gone about it. And then, But then for me more, Moeen scoring that 50 at, at three, you know, who, who at the start of 2023 was talking about Moeen Ali being England's number three. Um, you know, he, he walked out at three for the second innings at Headingley and everyone was like, what, what's going on? Um, and, you know, England had two injuries in that series to their number three and to their lead spinner. And Moeen, this guy who'd, who'd not really given a thought to Red Bull cricket, um, replaced them both. Um, and it was, it was a sort of innings where, um, I remember when he got to about 20, I just remember thinking, Every every run from here is just a bonus run. You know, no one there was no pressure on his shoulders at all. Um, and then suddenly, you're like, oh, he's 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 on thirty five. He's he's going pretty well. Um, and then you sort of remembered that actually the first decade of his professional career was essentially establishing himself as a, as a number three batter. Mm. And it was sort of a a reminder of how weird his career has been. That he does some things really well, and then is brought in to plug different gaps. Um, that might not necess- necessarily um, suit what he's best at, um, and I thought it was quite, it was a it was a fitting farewell, I think, from the test scene to see him essentially do a job that he hadn't really done for a decade um, <laughs> and do it and do it quite well as well. Um, so I think that was that was my favourite bit of the summer. Um, to finish off, we've got a few moments of the year from our listeners. Uh, David got in touch to say uh, my moment of the year. Sarah Glenn bowling Alyssa Healy at the Oval to set up Australia's collapse and give England the beginnings of a momentum which shifted the course of the women's ashes and turned it into a classic. I was there alongside my oldest friend and his now fiance, both not cricket fans, and the match was gripping enough to elicit a definite yes when I suggested going to the next women's T20I at the Oval against New Zealand next July. Um, yeah, that was another good thing about this summer. Just more, more England women's cricket in big cities. It had been years since England had played in a in a big city, so that was definitely a good thing. And the atmosphere at the Oval that day was was amazing. Um, Pratik gets in touch to say my moments of 2023 are Sandhu Sampson's uh, century for India. He's personally my favourite cricketer. Uh, Siraj's 
Asia Cup final spell when India bowled out Sri Lanka for 50, I think. And the media going gaga over Basball despite losing the Ashes. Um, well, England didn't lose the Ashes and uh, it was one win in 17 before Basball. So that is worth mentioning. Um, <laughs> but good to have a moment of the year uh, not from the Ashes because there, there was other cricket players. That's true. I mean, it, we could we could go that with, too, we could go with um, you'd have to throw in our dear friend Glenn Ma- Maxwell for that astonishing um, innings against Afghanistan, which is still one of the most extraordinary things I think I've ever seen. You think you've seen it, everything, and then that was just completely bonkers. Yeah, um, we'll come on to Maxwell in a second. And I guess for a lot of people watching and listening to this who, who are not based in the UK, I suppose England's World Cup would have been many people's moments. They'd have loved that, yeah. Um, seeing yeah. <laughs> as, as much as we struggled to, to uh, summon the energy to, to sort of... Uh, chew the fat on yet another England batting collapse. I think a lot of people, uh, but uh, yeah, our listenership outside of England increased during the World Cup. Let's just say I that. I bet it did. Um, Moo gets in touch, and this is related to Maxwell. Uh, Dear Wisdom Pod, my moment of the year happened somewhere between November seventh and eighth. I'd spent much of the afternoon and evening working on uh, finishing fixes to our shower, an effort that had taken me the better part uh, of of a week's work. Um, Since I live in the US, I'm lucky enough to be able to watch most cricket on replay in the evenings. Mornings are reserved for listening to your podcast for a few minutes on my way to work. While mending the shower on the evening of the 7th, I've been watching the eventually legendary Australia-Afghanistan match at the World Cup from earlier that day. I'd managed to finish up on my handiwork right about when Glenn Maxwell had flopped onto the ground and went full salmon and was getting medical attention. His partnership with Cummins had started to keep my interest in the game and give me motivation to push through and complete the job despite my waning interest. After I was done, I spent three to five overs worth of time with my wife extolling the virtues of batting with no footwork to her. Having decided that it was time to get ready for bed, I began brushing my teeth with a game playing on in my headphones. The match was nearing the 40th over and it dawned on me that we were in for a historic finish one way or another. And then it happened. I heard loud banging on the bathroom door from my usually cheerful wife and I knew it could only mean one thing. Her water had broken and game time had turned into game time. Did I mention she was nearly nine months pregnant? In the next 15 minutes, we called all the requisite medical personnel we were supposed to and sat down for a minute to check how everyone was doing. And making sure she was comfortable, I started gathering all the items off the checklist we had prepared for the occasion while keeping an eye on the match and furiously fast forwarding between balls and overs. I think what happened was part of my brain realised the need to stay occupied with anything that would permit the other part of my brain to prepare for what was to come on pure autopilot. I promise you I'm a dutiful and loyal husband and I suspect that the memorable nature of Maxwell's innings was what rose this game of cricket to the level of assistance I needed in the moment. I managed to finish watching the rest of the game just as the doctors called us back and told us that we ought to get on the road. Thoughts of the innings occupied my mind. <laughs> we passed the time of what should have been the longest 45-minute drive of my life thus far. We were blessed with a beautiful girl some eight to ten hours later. To my, mo- to my wife's credit, she totally understands that I was partly occupied by cricket <laughs> while repairing at such a critical moment in order to make it through calmly, even though that sounds a bit silly to say today. I'm thankful we didn't have a boy though. I didn't have I didn't have to have a conversation on whether Glenn or Maxwell would be suitable names for our child. Uh, thank you for another year of invigorating podcasts. Uh, kudos for the World Cup marathon you all undertook. Happy New Year, Moo. Um, that is that's an extraordinary telling uh, of of how you watched that game. Um, congratulations to the family, Moo. I guess. <laughs> Um, and I think that's a fitting place to end the show. Uh, thank you for staying with us throughout the year. Uh, hundreds of hours of podcasts, especially during the World Cup in the Ashes. Uh, we'll be back next week for our first episode of 2024. Cheers, Butch. Cheers, Ben. Catch you at the same time next week. Merry New Year. <laughs>